Oh, good morning, everyone. Wow, love to see all of you. What a tremendous time to be together and to celebrate. Uh, we welcome you to praise and worship, and we want to welcome those who are joining us online. We're here to celebrate the resurrection. And uh, I'm not going to give you the Easter greeting yet because that's in the service, so uh, we'll do that together in a moment. But let's uh, begin this morning by rising and singing one of my favorite Easter songs. Lo, in the grave he lay, and then you better come on strong with the end of each verse. Up from the grave he arose. Let's sing. Can you go back to that first slide? Uh, I forgot to say something about it. Easter isn't about the bunny. It's about the lamb. Kind of tells you where our world is. And this is not a political statement. But I don't know if you saw this week, but they have an art contest at the White House for Easter. And they have banned all religious elements in those art pieces. Now that kind of says where our world is. It's not about the bunny. It's about the lamb. Now let's go back to the responsive reading together. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's believe together and express that faith in the words this morning of the Nicene Creed. Notice in the first person singular, I can't believe for you, you can't believe for me. But this is what I believe, what you believe, together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. 
whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. I'm going to keep you standing. We can't sit down to sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. So let's sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Please be seated. Our word from the Lord this morning is the account of that resurrection on that first Sunday after Jesus' death from the Gospel of Luke. Let's listen together. Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. 
But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Let's sing together. I serve a risen Savior. Before we do this song, I wanted to, I asked Dora if it was okay for me to say a few words, and I wanted to share with you the story of how this song was written, because I think it's a neat story and one for us to remember. You all remember how the Jews responded when Jesus rose from the dead? They told, they told their disciples to go out and tell the people that Jesus' body had been stolen by his disciples. And that story is still being told today by the Jews. And uh, in the 1930s, this song was written by a man named William Akeley. He was a preacher. And he had been sharing the gospel with a, with a, a Jewish man in California. And uh, the, the question that this Jewish man could not get past was, why should I worship a dead Jew? And on Easter Sunday morning, William Akeley was getting ready. He was doing his morning routine. And uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick came on the radio. And for those of you that don't know, Harry Emerson Fosdick was probably the second most notorious heretic in American history. And he heard Harry Emerson Fosdick say, it doesn't matter to me whether the resurrection actually happened or not. For all I care, Jesus' body could be in a tomb in Palestine. But the main thing is his truth goes marching on. And William Akeley screamed at the radio, it's a lie. And, and that's, this song was written by him in defiance to that pro proclamation on the radio. And so when we get to the chorus of this song, I want you all to get loud and defiant, okay? Why don't you all stand up and let's sing this song. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart in all the world around me i see his loving care and though my heart grows weary i never see despair i know that he is leading through all the stormy blast the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives christ jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you ask me how i know he lives he lives within my heart rejoice rejoice O christian lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to jesus christ the king the hope of all who seek him the help of all who find none other is so loving so good and kind he lives he lives christ jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you ask me how i know he lives he lives within my heart 
Please be seated. This is a little impromptu. Uh, for those of you that are visiting this morning, we don't have children at praise and worship as much as we would like, but we got a whole bunch of children here this morning. And so I'd like to do a children's message. Now, I, I, I'm not going to limit the age, because so, so all of you think you're children of God, right. right? Okay. But some of the younger ones, if you'd like to come up and sit along here, I have a message just for you. And moms and dads, if you want to bring them up and sit with them, you can. Anybody gonna, brave enough to come up? Nobody? Come on. I don't bite. Okay, come on up and sit down right here. And I've got a message for all of you. Oh, good. We got some more coming. All right. Great. All right. How many of you like to travel and go visit different places? Now, I know you came to Branson, right? And, and that was a place you visited. Is there any other place you'd like to visit someday? Where? You like to go to Branson? So do I. You're, a, you're on my team. I like that too. Now, is anybody interested in traveling somewhere where they uh, can't drive a car? And, and you can't get there by driving a car. Uh, Some place like uh, Hawaii. Would you, would you like to visit a place like Hawaii? Now, what you, what you need to do if you're going to visit a place like that is that you can't drive a car, so what you have to do is you have to take an airplane. Do you think this airplane will take you to Hawaii? This one? Why, well, they're more gullible than I thought. Um, but, you know, and if you're going to make a paper airplane, this is not the best way to make it, by the way. This doesn't fly very good. So, this one will not take you to Hawaii. Okay? Now... There's another place that I'd like to go someday. And maybe it's a place you'd like to go, and maybe all of you would. I'd like to go to heaven someday. Would you? You know, and be with Jesus. He promised that that's what he would do for everyone who believes in him, right? So how do you get to heaven? Do you think an airplane... Yeah, do you think an airplane gets you to heaven? Do you think this one would? No. But maybe, since this plane is no good, it might teach us how to get to heaven. So since this airplane is worthless to get to heaven, or to go to Hawaii, I'm going to tear the wings off of it and see if it will teach us how to get to heaven. You ready? Is that how we get to heaven? By believing in Jesus who died for us. By the way, that's what it looks like. So we can't get to heaven by an airplane. We can't get to heaven because we're good enough, because we make mistakes and we sin, don't we? But what happened on the cross is Jesus took our sin and he died for us. He says, everyone who believes in him have their sins forgiven and will go to heaven someday. So I want to go to heaven someday. How about you? And we do it by believing in Jesus. Can you remember that? Okay. Now, usually, I've done this all over the world. That's why I could do it impromptu this morning. Uh, so usually afterwards, everybody comes up and says, Teach me how to do that, all right? So I will, 
but I'm going to give this cross to the one who spoke the most to me today. Okay? Now you can go back to your seats. Thank you for coming up. <laughs> I love doing those children's messages, and uh, it's just the nature of our situation here in Branson. We don't have a lot of children, but boy, we got them this morning, and I love it. Well, let's uh, take a moment to look at the uh, image on the screen. A lot can happen in a week. Uh, Palm Sunday, uh, last Sunday... Jesus welcomed with crowds cheering, coming into Jerusalem. And then the crown of thorns was put on him. He suffered. He ultimately went to the cross bleeding and then dying for our sins. And he did it all because of his love for us. And we talked about, uh, for those of you that may have been here Friday night, that it wasn't uh, the nails and that held Jesus to the cross, it was really his love for us. And so that's why the heart and the cross. And then, of course, in that last day of the week, this Sunday, he rose from the grave. During our Lenten season here at Praise and Worship, we've been uh, using a theme, the symbols of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. And this morning, we want to just use the symbol of the empty tomb. And I want to just share a few thoughts with you about uh, what the empty tomb means, and, and especially what it means for us. Now, on the back side of your bulletin is a brief outline, if you have a bulletin uh, and got that as you came in, uh, to follow along if you would like. And it's also a place if you want to take some notes, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that also. You heard the account from uh, the Gospel of Luke about uh, what happened on, on Easter morning as the women went to the tomb. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what was going on. Jesus died on Friday, and for the Jews, uh, the Sabbath was Saturday, and that began at 6 p.m. on Friday. That's why they had to get the body of Jesus off of the cross and into the grave. And, of course, uh, uh, that was an empty tomb that he was put in, and they rolled a stone across in front of it. And that uh, holy day, Sabbath day, went until 6 o'clock on Saturday night, and by that time, it was dark. And so the women were prepared to go and finish the embalming, which had been done very quickly because they had to be done by 6 o'clock on Friday. And so they went on first daylight at uh, Sunday morning after the Sabbath day. And when they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away, and uh, that stone was a very large stone, and uh, took several people to, to roll it across the grave and to open the grave. And that stone was put there not only to uh, keep out the uh, grave robbers uh, who might be there or animals that might get in, but it also was sealed by the Romans to have evidence that the disciples of Jesus wouldn't come and steal his body. And that's what we were talking about and what James shared with us before our last song. That was how Easter morning looked. Now, for me, it's kind of interesting that the disciples kind of picked up on what they wanted to hear. Now, I know none of us are like that. Uh, but we kind of sort out what we want to hear and what strikes us rather than listening to the whole message. Well, here, again, let me just repeat this for you. Uh, uh, we read it earlier also, but this is in Mark chapter 8. And he began to teach them, that's Jesus, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples... 
he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, keep in mind, Jesus had been living for some three years and carrying out his ministry with the disciples who followed him. And I keep referring to this, but it's certainly well worth referring to, and it might be an encouragement for some of you if you haven't done it. Look at the chosen. Watch that. And see how that happened in kind of a very human kind of way. So his disciples have been with him for three years. And now he starts to say, I've carried out my ministry primarily in, primarily in Galilee, which was the northern part of the, of the uh, country of Israel. And we're now going to go down to Jerusalem. Jerusalem the disciples knew, was where his enemies resided. That's where the, the Jewish hierarchy was. That's where the Sanhedrin was, the rulers of the Jews. And they were opposed to what Jesus was doing in his ministry and the miracles that he had performed. And so when he says, we're going down to Jerusalem, they first of all were concerned because they knew that was where his enemies resided. And then he tells them, I'm going to go down, and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and they're going to arrest me, and they're going to put me through all of that, and then I'm going to rise again. Now, what did they hear? It looks like they heard only about going where his enemies were and how he was going to suffer and die. And they kind of missed, I'm going to rise again. Peter even says you can't do that. You can't go down to Jerusalem. You can't put yourself in that danger. You cannot go through this. That's not who I expected when I was looking for the promised Savior. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're tempting me like Satan did after my baptism to do something contrary to what God wants. They didn't hear that he was going to rise again. And then if you look just uh, briefly at the account in Luke uh, one more time, uh, just looking at a couple of the verses there, in Luke chapter 24, verse 2, this is what uh, happened when they got to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And then if you go to verses 6 and 7, he is not here. The, that's the, what the angel said to them who was at the grave. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The disciples didn't get it. What they heard was what they didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear that Jesus was going to die, that he was going to suffer, that he was going to go through a punishment from his enemies as they went to Jerusalem. And they didn't hear him say, but after I go through all that, I'm going to come back to life again. What do we hear? There's an awfully lot of emphasis uh, in, in Christian preaching on the death of Jesus for our sins, and appropriately so. But all of that is absolutely meaningless if he did not also rise from the grave. It's kind of interesting how uh, the writers of the scriptures apply what Jesus' resurrection ought to mean in our lives, how, how it applies to us. And so that's where I'd like to focus uh, on the last part of my message this morning. What does the, this really mean for you and for me? What does it mean that Jesus is alive? If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians, this is uh, the Apostle Paul in uh, what uh, most call the great resurrection chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Here is what uh, the Apostle Paul says in verses 17 and 18. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus have perished. What does it mean that he not only died, but he rose again? It means it gives validity to our faith. What is the value of faith? Did you ever think of that? We put our faith in a lot of things, but the value of our faith that we put in whatever we put it in is the strength of the object. Did you ever think of that? I put my faith in an elevator when I want to go to another floor. And my faith is that when I press that button, the elevator is going to take me there. My faith in that object is only as good as that object. And by the way, if elevators fail once in a while. I don't know if anybody's ever been caught on an elevator that didn't go anymore. And when I get on an airplane, I have faith in the mechanics of that airplane and the person that's running the controls, but my faith is only as good as the object that I put my faith in. And we know that sometimes there's human failure, sometimes there's mechanical failure, and so the value of my faith is what I put it in. Our faith is futile if Jesus is not raised from the dead. Did you ever think of that? All the famous people that you may have known, uh, for the most part, now there's probably uh, you know, exceptions to this, but for the most part, if you have a famous person, you can go to where they're buried, and you can see their grave. And that is also true of the founder of every every world religion except Christianity. They can take you to the founder's tomb. Only Jesus is alive. And so my faith in the object of Jesus who died for my sins and rose again is solid and firm, not futile. The Apostle Paul says, your faith is futile. You're still in your sin if Jesus not only died, but also rose again. That's the only way our sin gets taken care of, because the one who died for us lives again. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And then another interesting element that Paul introduces. He said, and those who have fallen asleep in Jesus are perishing. There's no hope for them if Jesus is not raised. All those funerals that we've gone to of loved ones, some very near and dear to us, some long time in the past. If Jesus is not alive, those who are asleep in Jesus, and that's referring to those who have died before us, have perished. They're just dead and there's nothing more. But that, none of that is true because our faith is solid in a living Savior. And then in 1 Peter, Chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. This is um, what it ought to mean also in our lives. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's what God has done for us. 
We have a living hope. We use the term hope in our world in ways different than the Bible uses it. In our world, we say, I have a a golf game planned tomorrow. I hope it doesn't rain. I hope it doesn't, but it might. But in the Bible, we have a living hope that is certain. And the hope of the Bible is a certain hope that we have no question about. And it all depends on the resurrection of Jesus. That's what it means for those who believe. We put our faith in an object, a person who is human yet divine, who died but lives again and will never die again. That's what it means for those who believe in him. And it's based on a living Savior. And then in Colossians chapter 3, what's my life going to look like if I have trust and faith in a living Savior? This is kind of uh, straightforward. It's kind of like, this is what you ought to be. This is what you will be. This is what will happen as you put your trust in a living Savior. This is how Paul says it to the Colossians in chapter 3, the first four verses. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Set your mind not on earthly things. Earthly things pass away. As much as we'd like to hang on to them, people in our lives pass away. Material items pass away. They never stay the same. They are never always there. So if you are in the resurrection of Jesus and you have been raised with him by faith in him, think about what lasts forever. Don't think about what passes away. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't want us to live our lives to the fullest, but it means that we don't put our confidence in what we have now. This will all pass away. Think on things that are above. Someday, because my sins are forgiven by a living Savior, As you believe that and I believe that, when we have our life come to an end in this world, this moment of death becomes just a doorway from this life into life eternal. That's a confidence that we can have. And I want to think about that's what's going talked with a man this past week, and we were uh, talking about some of the struggles we have in life, and uh, he said to me something that I thought was really kind of cool. He said, you know, as we go through all of this, the only thing that gives me hope is that I know who finally wins. That's our living Savior. Think about that. Now, here's another thing I want you to think about. If you think about things above, And where you will go by faith in Jesus, the living Savior, think also about who you want to take with you. Who do you want to go to heaven with you? You know, I say this sometimes at funerals. um, You can't take it with you. You never see a funeral coach pulling a U-Haul trailer. You can't take it with you. But there is something you can take with you, your family and your friends. 
And the only way you can take them with you, think about things above, who do I want there with me? And how are they going to get there? Only as they know Jesus, who did indeed suffer and die, but also rose again. Many years ago, something that changed my life was an evangelism ministry that was begun by D. James Kennedy, a Presbyterian pastor in Florida. And some of you may know that history and others may not. It was called Evangelism Explosion. And they had a film that promoted how to witness to people is what that really was. And I, I embraced that and taught it to hundreds of people. But I'll never forget the movie that portrayed it. D. James Kennedy was standing, he was down in Florida, and he was standing on the beach, and all these apartments and condos lined the beach. And D. James Kennedy had a young man with him. And he pointed there, and he said, see all those buildings there? They're full of people, and a lot of those people don't know about Jesus. And the camera turned to the young man, and he had kind of a, you know, a V8 moment. And he said, Dr. Kennedy, who's going to tell? And Dr. Kennedy said, if we don't tell them, we who believe in Jesus, they'll never know. I like to think when I think of things above, not on things on the earth. I think about my family above all and my friends that I want to take with me. And that's only possible by faith in a Savior who died for our sins and rose again. It's a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of living. That's what the resurrection of Jesus does in our lives. Would you pray with me about that? Heavenly Father, we, we are awed on this day to come together and praise you for not only sending your Son to die for us and pay all the price for our sins and our guilt and our punishment, but that we can celebrate that he lives again and will never die. Help us to put our confidence in him, to get our hope from him, to get our change of life from him, and to get our desire to tell others from him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bill Crosby is our elder on duty today, and we ask our elders to uh, lead us in prayers for the church. Here at Praise and Worship, we uh, are privileged to be small enough to pray for everything. We pray in the Spirit in every situation. We use every kind of prayer and request. Always be alert, keep praying, and make every kind of request for all of God's people. That's what we try to do. And I keep a running list of our uh, prayer requests, the public ones. If you have any prayer requests, I encourage you to reach out to one of the elders. Let's pray. Lord God, today we pray for our leaders. Seemingly our country is going astray and we pray for correction. Lord, we pray for the Great Commission to all nations. We pray in this time of struggle against anti-Semitism that's rearing its ugly head in our nation and around the world again today. Lord, we lift up all area churches who proclaim the truth of the word and for the pastors who lead us and bring us his truth. We pray for tithes and offerings which suffer in this economy. Lord, we pray for the mission of this church, for our Bible studies, for our small groups, that we may be a place of Jesus' love, discipleship, and respite. 
Lord, we pray over the call process as we are, that we are in searching for a new pastor. Thank you, God, for this trying time for our church. We thank you for our struggles as they build perseverance. Lord, it's a big week as Pastor Matt will be informing us of where God has led him in response to the call that we issued him. Lord, I pray that we would rejoice if God leads Matt to say yes, and I pray that we would rejoice if God leads Matt to say no, because it's God leading. So be with us this week, Lord. Lord, we pray for a restore and the mission of that church and Barry and the ministries that it does in its community. We pray for uh, FLS, Faith Lutheran School, for the very successful gala that they had that raised $100,000 to get that school going. Lord, we pray for many in our congregation. We pray for Pat Peters and continued recovery. We pray for Josh Clammers for cancer. Lord, we praise uh, for Loretta, who's now in remission from cancer. We pray for Dennis, Harley's cousin, who's on hospice care. We continue to pray for Marvin Unters, Arvid's brother. He's, told, he's been told he's in the final days of life, and he keeps on living, so we keep him on our prayer list. Lord, give him comfort. Give his family comfort. We pray for Patch's daughter-in-law, Shannon, for a diagnosis and for whatever is wrong with her. For Patch's grandson, Aiden, who was bullied and assaulted at school and had a concussion. Pray for Midge on the death of her brother, Gail, and for Gail's wife and family. Pray for Craig in an upcoming surgery on his hand. Lord, we pray for our shut-ins that we may serve them. We pray for our children and grandchildren that they may know you and be in church. We pray for our visitors that they may know the love of Jesus in the, in, the, in the people of this place and in this place and that you are welcome to that love. We pray for those among us who need healing, those among us who are struggling, those among us who are hurting, and those among us who are questioning. And Lord, we all pray for them together in the prayer that you taught us to pray that's on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our preparation for the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to ask Bill maybe to go down here with us. I'm going to join you, and we're going to examine ourselves. We're going to ask the question, and then my prayer is that you can agree with the answer that I've put on the screen. Uh, I don't want to assume that, but I pray that that's what's in your heart. And because I need it, Bill needs it, we're going to join you right down here. So if you would rise, let's uh, prepare to receive the Lord's Supper with blessing by examining ourselves. Since our intention to commune with our Savior in His Word and Supper, it is proper for us to examine ourselves in order to commune with blessing. Therefore, let us ask ourselves. Am I a sinner? Yes, I am a sinner, born sinful and continually sinning. Am I sorry for my sin? Yes, I am truly sorry for my sin against God and other people. 
Do I believe Jesus died and rose again for my sin? Yes, I believe Jesus bore my sins on the cross and forgives me fully and freely. Do I intend, with God's help, to change my sinful ways? Yes, it is my intention to live for Jesus, who died for me and rose again, and to live according to his word. Do I believe Jesus' body and blood are present with the bread and wine in his supper? Yes, I believe Jesus gives me his body and blood with the bread and wine to assure me I am his, I am forgiven, and I have a place with him in heaven. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. These are the words of Jesus printed on the screen. They are the words that give this meal its blessing for us. Notice he simply says, holding a piece of bread, this is my body. Holding a cup, this is my blood. Take him at his word, he says it simply. Don't understand that? Don't know how it's possible? Can't scientifically investigate it? But he said it, I believe it, and that settles it forever. These are Jesus' words. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in memory of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in memory of me. The peace and the power of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. Just a couple of notes, uh, especially uh, for our visitors. Uh, we have gluten-free bread available. If that's something that you need, simply ask Bill for that. And we also have non-alcoholic grape juice. And if that's something you prefer, just simply uh, let me know that as you come up. We kind of do it informally here, like maybe four rows at a time. Uh, and have you come up and just kind of make an, uh, it's not a semicircle, it's an arc. Uh, somebody reminded me of that. I keep saying semicircle, it's an arc. So uh, we will uh, uh, kind of do that informally. So maybe four rows at a time, and then we'll do the second half and then do the same thing over here. So would those who are in the first four rows come up? <laughs>
Wow, I don't know about you, but this was a great day and it's not over yet. May God be above you to bless you, within you to sanctify you, around you to protect you, and before you to guide you. And may God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Let's rise and sing, this is the feast of victory. One, two. There we are. This is the feast of victory. This is a little taste of heaven, you know. God bless your day. God bless your Easter. Uh, live in the resurrection. There's a whole bunch of people that I know a bunch of us haven't met. So meet somebody you haven't met, and I'll greet all of you at the door.